Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third webinar on the South South Dialogues series that was developed by De Justicia and our colleagues from the Legal Agenda in Beirut, Lebanon. So this series is possible thanks to the support of the Ford Foundation, and it's part of the broader project that seeks to facilitate a much needed global discussion on shared human rights challenges and exchange of experience between different regions of the world. My name is Mariluz Barragan Gonzalez, and I'm Deputy Director at De Justicia in Colombia, uh, in Bogota, Colombia. So, buenos días to, uh, a nuestra audiencia hispanohablante que nos acompaña el día de hoy. Eh, podrán ver la transmisión en español a través del Facebook Live del de portal Pacifista en el link que encuentran en nuestra sesión de comentarios. Pueden dejar también sus preguntas en español y nosotros con mucho gusto la traduciremos a los panelistas. Ok, uh, jumping back to English, uh, in this session, closing of a speak, a space of uh, civic space in times of COVID-19, strategic litigation and advocacy strategies, we seek uh, to explore the different challenges that civil society face in the global south and to understand what the current impact of COVID-19 crisis is on the protection of their rights. Before introducing our panelists, I would like to welcome Melissa Avila from Melissa Draws. Wiser Together. She is joining us today and will be creating the graphic uh, summary of our conversation. This will be compiling uh, the most important points discussed and will be available for the loud in the following days. So Melissa, can you please show us your empty board so the audience can see uh, how you process a start? Thank you, Mariluz, but it's, it says a uh, host has disabled the attendee screen sharing. Can you please allow me? Yeah, sure. So I think we, we are struggling with, with that. So we, we can continue and then at the end of the process you can uh, share the the final um, the the final role. So okay, thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Um, now I would like to to welcome our three panelists, two of them from the MENA region and the other from LATAM. So all of them experts in the field of strategic litigation and judicial system. They will share their reflections as advocates of human rights from different parts of the world. The first, the first person I would like to introduce is Nisar Sagi. So Nisar is a lawyer, co-founder, and executive director of the Legal Agenda since, since uh, 2011. He has researched and written extensively on a wide range of legal topics, including war memories, freedom of oppression, and vulnerable groups. He has also pursued a strategic litigation in relation uh, to the complex social issues, issues such as arbitrary detentions of refugees and disappeared in Lebanon civil war. Also, is joining us today Carolina Villadiego. Carolina is a lawyer, a specialist in judicial uh, systems in and its connection with human rights in Latin America. She has developed various uh, advocacy strategies in this field. Her publication includes several articles such as the multi-thematic and diverse reforms of justice in Latin America and non-criminal justice systems in Latin America. Currently, she is legal advisor for Latin America of the International Commission of the Jurists. She's also part of the board of director of the Justicia. Welcome, Carolina. So finally, uh, from Jordan, we have Linda Alcalash. Linda uh, is the executive director of Tanken for Legal Aid and Human Rights since 2007. So she leads a team of lawyers, researchers, and advocates to combat human trafficking. So through years, she has also represented Tanken in a number uh, of national, regional, and international conferences and events 
that focus on labor issues, migrant workers, and migration, legal aid, and human trafficking. Welcome again, Nisar, Carolina, and Linda. Thank you, all of you, for your willingness to share with your time and expertise with us for what I'm pretty sure will be a very grateful and interesting conversation. So to start, I would like to provide an overview of some experience of strategic litigation and advocacy in MENA and LATAM regions in the context of COVID-19. So um, global society, governments, communities, and individuals are being tested by the pandemic. So respect for human rights, including civil, political, economic, and social rights, will be fundamental to success uh, the public health response. Even though the COVID-19 is generating suffering and damage in every region, it has disparate negative impact in the global South countries. So in terms of civil and political rights, government have been taking exceptional decisions. Emergency measures may well be needed to respond to this public health uh, emergency, but an emergency situation is not an excuse to disregard human rights obligations. All measures must be necessary and proportional. With this premise uh, that has not been taken into consideration in the most governments, some countries have taken measures to impose restriction of media freedoms and freedom of expression. With the excuse of misinformation, these measures could be easily applied to any criticism. In some countries, we have already seen reports of journalists being penalized for reporting the, last, the lack of masks, health working for denouncing lack protection, and ordinary people arrested for social media posting about the pandemic. According to the UN High Commissioner of Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, arrest for expressing discontent or allegedly spread false information through the press or social media have been reported in Bangladesh, Cambodia, China, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Nepal, Philippines, Sri Lanka, Thailand, and Vietnam. So actually, just yesterday, yesterday in that sense, we have uh, concerning news here in Colombia uh, because people now, who spread fake news about the pandemic situation could be, pen could be penalized for terrorism. So that seems that we are joining this political trend. So on the other hand, regarding uh, to economic and social rights, in the North Global country, fault lines in access to healthcare, uh, labor rights and social protection and living spaces, and indignity are suddenly very visible. Like in the United States, with the disproportional impact of the negative effects of the pandemic in African-Americans and Latino people. However, in the South global countries, where a large portion of the population may rely on daily income to survive, the current impact is far greater. So, the millions of people who have little access to health care or who, by necessity, live in a crowded condition with poor sanitation, are no safety net, no clean water, will suffer most. So they are less likely to be able to protect themselves from the virus. In this context, the pandemic is likely to create even wider inequalities. So extensive economic and social measures have been taken in some countries to face the negative effects of the pandemic and minimize the further growth of inequalities. Some, uh, uh, some others have explored new financial mechanisms to fund global solidarity. For example, the African Development Bank raised the world's largest uh, social bond, a uh, 3 million US dollar fund to assist African government to expand access to health and the other essential services and goods. Despite those efforts, most of the global countries in the South have less capacity to mitigate the economic and social impacts of the pandemic. Um, after times of uh, social economic stress, 
disputes and litigation significantly increased. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, with its unprecedented impact on every single phase of life, is likely to give a rise uh, to a tsunami of disputes. So um, uh, South global countries could soon face a wave of lawsuits from multinational corporations claiming compensation for a measure introduced to protect people from the COVID-19. But it seems to be an upcoming problem. So what has not been delayed are urgent litigation and advocacy actions related to the protection of human rights. As COVID-19 expanded, the reaction of the mobilized civil society were also being activated. So the development of the novel advocacy strategies and litigation have been common to control the measures taken by the governments in the global south. For example, in Zimbabwe, doctors have taken to government to the court over its failure to provide them a protective gear during the coronavirus pandemic. So the association has demanded that the government must urgently provide uh, personal, personal protective equipment for all medical practitioners in Zimbabwe. Similarly, a few days ago here in Colombia, the constitutional judge ruled, that, uh, ruled in favor of a group of doctors who work in one of the poorest regions of the country. In this case, as for litigation, uh, the national government was pushed to grant uh, the necessary biosecurity equipment to the plaintiff. So this is just in order that the, the, the plaintiffs could carry out their work safely. So also uh, after some human rights advocacy, so these Asian nations are joining the growing list of, of countries to release prisoners from overcrowded uh, jails. So for example, in Indonesia, start freeing uh, some 30,000 prisoners that is about uh, 10% of the prison population because of the risk of coronavirus in, in early April. So also in Lebanon, as a consequence of advocacy action, the national government took a set of measures to protect migrants, domestic workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. So the authorities ensure that migrant uh, domestic workers are protected for exploitative working conditions during lockdown. So, and that means all domestic workers, including, including the in the combated. So now they have access to health courts during the pandemic. So in Colombia, even some cases that did not start on occasion of the COVID-19, uh, the judicial decisions were influenced by the context, such as the case of protection of social leaders. So just to contextualize the subject, Colombia is one of the most dangerous countries for human rights defenders. In the mentioned case, the judge ordered that the Colombian government to protect, should, should, or must protect a uh, human rights defender without officials being able to excuse themselves in the pandemic for not complying. So the main reason judge put forward was that human rights are not suspended in the states of emergency for the pandemic. So I live in the context up to this point because the idea is that our panelists help us, uh, help us to understand better the situation of a strategic litigation and advocacy on human rights in the Middle East and uh, Latin America regions and why not to propose us some strategies to guarantee the protection of the rights in the current context. So we invite our audience to leave any question you may have for our panelists in the chat, in English or in Spanish. So, and afterwards we will have a question and our se uh, or an answer sections. So to start the discussion, I would like to invite Nisar first. Uh, to share with us a brief contest of a strategic litigation and advocacy on human rights patterns in the MENA region. Nizar, the floor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Marilis. Um, so I, I mean, I, I am from Legal Agenda. Legal Agenda is a law and society project 
and we focus on judiciary and we are involved with many strategic litigation on matters of social and economic rights and others. What I would like to stress on is um, a, a distinction uh, to which we are uh, very attached, which is to make a distinction always between what is popular strategic litigation and unpopular strategic litigation. Or if you want, uh, uh, having litigating for popular issues or unpopular issues. What is popular? So when, it, when um, the majority is approving uh, a right and uh, still this right is not recognized or is not respected, so you go to court in order to force the authorities to, uh, to, to grant this right. But um, so here, I mean, um, and what is unpopular is when the majority disapproves uh, uh, this right you are fighting for, like, for example, for migrants in general, refugees, or even uh, in our region, LGBT, sometimes women rights, and so on. And we have two different strategies, completely different. And we know very well that this, um, the, um, the difference between two is not stable. So sometimes what is popular might become unpopular and what is unpopular might become popular. I explain. So when we were fighting for uh, freedoms, for example, or civic rights, or uh, I mean, individual rights, uh, individual freedoms, uh, it was like a, a, a um, in general, a popular issue because everybody identifies uh, him or himself, herself with this. Um, so now with Corona, <laughs> this issue, when it's becoming uh, like a balance between health and freedom, so it becomes sometimes unpopular. So when we talk about a curfew, if this curfew is necessary or proportional, so the uh, instinctive uh, 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 opinion is, is quite against. I mean, and they are saying, oh, you are trying to uh, endanger society by defending these freedoms, while we are trying to defend legality and uh, that any measure is proportional. So we had these problems uh, recently with curfews and so on. And also another example of what is uh, pop, uh, unpopular, which become popular, is uh, women's rights, if you want, in some areas, especially when they are victims of violence. So a few years ago, it was too unpopular. Now it becomes like uh, mainstream that we refuse this violence against women and so on. And you know very well that even in Corona times, I mean, we had many, many issues with domestic violence and so on. Um, so of course, I mean, when we are uh, handling a popular strategic litigation or unpopular, we have two different uh, set of tools and instruments and strategies. So it's not the same, it's totally different. And uh, we, uh, for example, when it's popular, I mean, we try to mobilize the public opinion. We do everything to, uh, through media. Uh, through, uh, and the aim is to show that um, um, what is done, the practice or whatever is illegal. So we, uh, our main argument is legal and is law and uh, uh, how to show uh, that the practice is abusive, illegal. Sometimes we are shaming. And we are asking the judge always to be loyal to the majority, to loyal to society, I mean, uh, and uh, uh, to, to face the power and the power for people. But when, when uh, and our style is denouncing, shaming, what, whatever you want. When we are tackling a non-popular issue through strategic litigation, our strategy is different is less uh, using the law in order to uh, impose what is legal. It's more to convince, uh, to convince through law, but also through social research. So it becomes like if we are not only, um, um, we are making much less uh, um, uh, recourse to media, but much more recourse 
to uh, social research because there we, are, we need more arguments in order to rationalize the debate to rationalize the debate over Corona, to rationalize the debate over any other uh, issue about homosexuality or about migrants uh, and so on. So uh, uh, the strategy litigation becomes not a mobilization uh, tool, but uh, it in order to rationalize and uh, how to make that in such ways that court becomes a platform to rationalize the debate over uh, the issue we are working on. And um, of course, the judge here, we don't tell the judge you have to face uh, the most powerful. You have to face here the a priori, the preconceived ideas, and you have to, 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 to think out of the box and uh, to uh, always to make uh, recourse to what is rational and what is not. And our style is different. It's not shaming, it's not denouncing. It's, uh, it's a more uh, social uh, um, uh, uh, thoughts and uh, trying to convince, uh, trying to bring uh, the adverse idea to discuss with us, to, to, to try to give their arguments. And then we exchange arguments through the court and so on. Um, so that's why, I mean, when we are working on uh, unpopular issues like now it is the case when we work on migrants who are deported who are forced to deport or who are fired because we don't need them anymore during corona times because we don't have enough resources so the people that we exploited for many years now we want to terminate the contract with them because we don't want to pay we are, we are no more able to pay uh, and that becomes uh, everybody now uh, during Corona times after the productivity of people becomes much less. I mean, and, uh, uh, and the, the, uh, the revenues become much less. Everybody can say, I have no more money, so I want to terminate with migrants. So we have this very big issue of migrants uh, fired, and when we say migrants, most of them in Lebanon are domestic workers. So living inside uh, the house where they are working, so they are fired. That means, uh, uh, I mean, uh, subject to deportation, of course. So here it's very difficult now during Corona time to find a way to litigate because um, I mean, most courts are not operating now during Corona times and they stopped. So what we need to develop and what we are developing now is um, how to have this cross-border litigation. And this one of the most, um, uh, I mean, we are, we are trying to develop this. Um, the cross-border deportation, that means uh, litigation, sorry, that, that means that this litigation will, will start once the migrants are deported. So after they are deported, we get power of attorney and we start uh, uh, litigating. We thought many years ago that it might be the most effective uh, litigation in our country because of uh, the, uh, un because the power, the, the relation is so much unbalanced and uh, the employer is much, much more powerful than the employee. And then you have all this preconceived idea and so. But now we score, I mean, our, our, our main challenge was to convince judges how to use uh, technology and uh, online, uh, like we are doing now, uh, uh, to, to hear the, the story of domestic workers, the narrative of domestic workers. Because we had, the, I mean, because of the system in Lebanon, which is very complicated, uh, we don't have time to explain, is the sponsorship system. So deportation becomes always the solution once there is any litigation between the employer and the employee. And so we need, we don't have any narrative in, in, in courts about the miseries, about the abuses, about the trafficking, forced labor. And we needed, absolutely to develop this cross-border litigation. And now, I mean, yes, I mean, it's, the problem becomes much bigger for migrants. They are deported in big number. 
But uh, still, I mean, we have an opportunity now because uh, thanks to Corona, for the first time now we have online uh, interrogation with uh, people who are accused, the people who are uh, uh, prosecuted uh, for common reasons and for, I mean, inside Lebanon even, because the, the judge does not want to uh, risk uh, uh, contamination. So they are doing the interrogations through online. So now we have this opportunity and the Ministry of Justice is setting up this. Uh, so now all we are working on um, regarding migrants is this kind of um, uh, developing the cross-border litigation and we think that it might have, it might offer us much more narrative about it. Um, I have two other ideas and then I will stop. And of course, I will answer any question after. Uh, so now the main work was done on the pre-trial arrest because uh, during Corona times, I mean, the pre-trial arrest is very, very common in Lebanon, very frequent, more than 50% of people who are in jail are uh, in pre-trial arrest. Uh, and before judges, uh, I can talk about Tunisia also, they had this habit that each time somebody, there is very strong evidence that he is, uh, that he committed a crime, we uh, arrest him. So during Corona times, I mean, there were lots of uh, discourse about it. To, to redefine the pre-trial arrest conditions and to reduce the number of uh, uh, arrestation uh, during uh, the trial. Uh, and, and lots of people were freed, uh, of course, with uh, Corona. And we start to talk about proportionality and necessity of uh, arresting somebody uh, during this time. So it was another opportunity also to develop this discourse about who should be arrested uh, during uh, this trial uh, uh, and so on. The last uh, point I would say, I mean, I am so, I mean, I feel that there is a big challenge regarding the social and economic rights uh, during this crisis, because as you know now, um, um, I mean, resources, revenues are much less. In Lebanon, we have a very, very big economic problems. It's not very far from what's happening in Venezuela, I think, uh, with bankruptcy and so on. So what kind of social and economic rights can you really defend and which might have a chance during such period, and especially with Corona and so on. And I am afraid that we are uh, uh, facing um, a period where it will be very difficult to defend such rights um, uh, and that it might be, uh, because I mean, it's not that we have resources and we don't know how to allocate them, but we don't have any more resources and we need maybe to bring more resources from those who have. And this makes that maybe the social rights will be more in the political arena than in the legal one. Uh, so I finish with this note. Uh, and of course, I can answer all the questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nisar. So I want to strand, uh, stress some points about your presentation. It is uh, called my attention that uh, you already uh, like a um, identify some positive effects of human rights of this situation corona in, in corona times uh, those issues that were in, unpopular before and now with the coronavirus become popular like women uh, rights using digital tools in justice and talk about necessity and proportional issues so but also uh, you talk about the um, basically you are facing so many challenges because of the access to justice now is kind of limited, right? So because most of the judicial offices are closed. With that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give the floor to Carolina who is gonna explain us a little bit about what are the challenges that we are facing in this part of the world and about the judicial systems and what are 
the measures that are, have, be, uh, have been taken uh, to overcome this, uh, like uh, the situation that we are facing now. So Carolina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mariluz. Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. And thanks to the Justicia and Legal Agenda for inviting me to participate in this webinar. My intervention will focus on three different issues. First, I will provide an overview on the general measures that were adopted by judiciaries in South American countries during the pandemic. Then I will present an overview of the main concerns regarding those measures. And at last, I will address some points of action in advocacy and litigation um, regarding the need to strengthen access to justice during the pandemic. So with that, I'll move to the first point, which is a general overview of the, ex of the measures adopted by judiciaries. So in general terms for our public, uh, in South America, most of South, South, South America in early March, uh, as coronavirus cases were confirmed, most governments adopted uh, general measures as in ev every other country in the world, consisting of isolation, social distancing, and so on. So with that in mind, judiciaries in South America also adopted several measures uh, with the aim to provide access to justice that protect uh, people's health during the process too. So as a result, and in general terms, uh, ICJ with other NGOs did a re an overall review on the general measures adopted by judiciaries. And there were, in general terms, four general measures adopted by most judiciaries in South America. The first general measure was to postpone proceedings in ordinary matters. So that's why uh, many proceedings in civil cases, labor cases, etc., were postponed. Uh, second, the judiciaries adopted measures where they allowed uh, judges and other judiciaries personnel uh, to work remotely. Uh, so that's also to say that judges and, and other personnel are working from their homes or remote and they are advancing in some cases. The third general measure that was adopted was to provide um, some digital justice or virtual justice measures. And that includes several specific measures. I would just highlight, for example, being able to present uh, remedies or reads by email or doing some video some hearings by video conferencing. And the fourth general measure that was adopted by judiciaries was to uh, provide and keep continuing to provide access to justice in specific measures that were considered urgent or essential. Uh, it is not necessarily clear the definition of urgent and essential, and there are differences between each country, but basically we could identify at least four types of uh, cases that were considered in this category. Uh, remedies that guarantee fundamental rights, so basically habeas corpus or um, constitutional actions that protect fundamental rights, as for example in Colombia, Tutela or Amparo in other countries of this region. Uh, the second measure was, for example, um, that the judiciary allowed uh, proceedings that include judicial review of deprivation of liberty. Uh, so, for example, control of detentions, control of apprehension, so on. Then there were also uh, there are also cases of domestic violence and protecting measures on cases of domestic violence. Uh, other urgent matters in specific cases, for example, that involve uh, child uh, parenting support and judicial review of governmental measures adopted during emergency states, these in some countries. So those are like the basic uh, general measures that were adopted by judiciaries during the pandemic. Three months, almost three months have passed since these uh, measures were adopted and what is the status now in South America? So this changes between each country and between each reality, but in general terms, uh, most of the, of the measures have been extended in time as the government has also extended in time um, isolation and, distance and social distancing measures. Uh, some of the measures are all, have also been reviewed by judiciaries. So meaning that they have, for example, um, 
make it a wider mandate on the extension of access to justice in specific cases. So now many judiciaries have more cases that they are actually uh, receiving uh, writs and um, remedies. And uh, they're also, some of them are, are analyzing or deciding on how to uh, move on on a middle, you know, a middle term plan uh, with the pandemic. So with this in mind, I will turn now to the second part of my presentation that is about the main concerns of uh, how these measures have affected access to justice and what do we need to do now because there's no strategic liquidation with courts closed. So what are the main concerns? And as I said, also this is part of a joint uh, analysis that we made with other NGOs in this region. I will highlight for this presentation uh, five main concerns. First, uh, there, there has been a reduced access to justice in all countries of South America uh, during this time of the pandemic. And this has a special effects on persons that are under vulnerable conditions, as for example, persons that are um, in prison or that their trial is pending or um, migrants that need uh, their fundamental rights to be protected immediately and so on. So as it has been three months, it is important that judiciaries come up with a clear and transparent plan on how are they going to provide access to justice in the immediate term and also in a middle term plan. The second uh, concern, main concern, is that there has been lack of a comprehensive uh, and public information regarding all the measures adopted by judiciaries. There has been in some countries uh, more publicity than in others, but in general terms, what is what is important to mention here is that there's lack of real information about how are the measures adopted to, by judiciaries worked in the past, how are they work, working now, and um, how are they working in the specific parts of each country. So as some of them are general measures for the country, we also want to know specifics on how this affects uh, access to justice in specific regions in each country. The third type of concerns that have arised with uh, these measures of the judiciary are problems uh, that, as, that came up with um, the um, uh, virtual or digital justice. So as this is a very important tool, there are two main concerns here. One is that um, there is a digital gap uh, also for, in, in the pers for persons in a country and there is due and that gap is due to lack of connectivity, lack to access to computers, to internet, and even if there is connectivity, service, internet services are expensive, so not everyone has access to it. And on that point, the issue is that if uh, judiciaries are providing a lot of access to justice through digital measures, there is a, there is, this is uh, generating a disproportionate affection of people that do not have access to internet or access to these mechanisms. And then there's a, like a second part of concerns regarding digital justice, which is that we need to analyze further the impact of these of video conferences in specific hearings, for example, on due process guarantees and right to counseling, um, especially in criminal cases, especially for persons that are detained. With that, uh, I'll move to the four uh, set of concerns, which is um, that we, one of the other set of concerns is that there is um, a need to address if there has been real judicial review of governmental measures. So as governments have adopted a lot of uh, measures to um, fight against the pandemic, uh, judicial control is important. And there's some, in some countries there has been more judicial review than in others, and even in a country like Colombia, where there's some judicial review, there's also differences on what are, um, if they have been able to control all governmental measures in time. And the five type of concerns that I will raise is that there's also a lack of information about the real conditions of judges and judicial personnel that are working remotely. 
So as the judiciary um, basically closed, but the judges and judges homes or not, if they do have access to computers or not, um, if there's, um, if they are also caring for children and what is the impact on that, on the work, on the work, et cetera. So those are like, like the five main concerns that I wanted to highlight for this presentation. And with that, I will turn to the last part of my presentation, which are uh, some points of actions on advocacy and litigation uh, regarding access to justice. So on the advocacy side, um, I will stress that judiciaries need to explain and come up with a clear and transparent plan on how they're going to guarantee access to justice not only in urgent or essential matters, but in all matters, and how are they how are they really going to put um, a plan to provide this kind of access to justice, considering also the need to protect health uh, for persons that attend uh, proceedings and also for judges personnel. And I think uh, almost three months from uh, having spread this pandemic in this region. This is a mass needed advocacy plan now uh, for advocates and human rights defenders to advocate for the judiciaries to do, to do this. And on the litigation uh, side, I will stress that um, we need to be really um, strong on having uh, the judicial, judicial review of governmental measures, the measures that have been adopted during the pandemic, also uh, to, to be on top of knowing if there is really access to justice um, for persons that are under vulnerable conditions, such as persons that are deprived from liberty or with lack of access to health, to water, uh, to housing, etc. And finally, I would say that as access to justice is guaranteed, needs to be guaranteed to everyone, if judiciary is going to move to a more digital um, approach, there is need for us to uh, litigate in the need for uh, having access to justice, access to internet in um, an equality condition. So uh, there's, there's no point of providing too much access to justice by internet if persons do not have access to internet or if internet access, internet services are very expensive. So with that, I will uh, close my presentations. I thank you all, and I am also available for questions. Thank you so much, Carolina. Uh, so again, we invite our audience to leave any questions you may have for our panelists in the chat in English and Spanish, and afterwards we will have a question and answer session. So, um, Cualquier pregunta que ustedes puedan tener para nuestros panelistas, eh, para Carolina, que acaba de hacer eh, una interesantísima presentación, la pueden dejar en nuestro chat y nosotros con muchísimo gusto la traduciremos eh, para nuestros panelistas al final de la sesión de preguntas y respuestas. So, thank you so much again, Carolina. So now uh, I would like to jump back uh, to the MENA region for uh, giving the floor to Linda. So she will present us how uh, all those challenges are experienced on one of the issues of greatest uh, social tensions in the region. This is migration and human trafficking. So Linda uh, is going to uh, explain us how they, they, they are facing the challenges that we already uh, uh, explained to us in uh, Nisar, but also we have so many uh, points in common with, with what happened in the MENA and Latin region that uh, such as already Carolina, Carolina uh, just explained us. So Linda, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much for, for being here today. Linda, your, your, your microphone is... Again, it's a seal to... Around, please. Yes, no, okay. it's okay. 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 Yes, yeah. um, I'm very happy to be here today to talk about this issue. 
uh, in general, Tam can work with the uh, uh, labor, with the issue regarding to labor migrants and uh, countering uh, counter human trafficking. Uh, and all of us know about the situation of migrant workers in every place, not only in Jordan or in Mia region, in all the world, the uh, uh, migrants always suffering from discrimination and other. Um, in Jordan, maybe if, if we are talking about the, what happened through uh, a combating uh, uh, pandemic, um, in the beginning, uh, uh, many uh, people uh, were released from uh, uh, detention or from prison, but uh, uh, the migrants still there. Uh, but uh, in, in, in the beginning of of, uh, of the uh, situation, of this situation in, in March, last March, the government reactivated the uh, defense uh, uh, law. Defense law to deal with, with this issue. Defense law gives the government uh, right to disappeal all legislation. So through this period, we have almost uh, only the, um, the order that issued by the government. Most of the order, uh, the, the, the main one about uh, uh, freedom of, uh, of movement that prevent people to go out of the houses, regardless anything, this prevent people to go to, to purchase the food, only the food. And uh, we have, of course, migrant workers, especially migrants in a regular situation, especially domestic workers that work as freelancer or in regular in a regular situation that they need help, but nobody no uh, no um, nobody uh, provide them with humanitarian assistance or the assistance only for Jordanian. Even the workers in in a regular situation, uh, when the government issued the, the uh, defense uh, uh, orders, they have uh, a number number nine, especially number nine. Uh, it has many programs about uh, social protection, but with excluding migrants, in spite migrants contribute in social uh, social security like Jordanian and other. We noted through this period that uh, maybe absence for the justice in, in general. Uh, and nobody can uh, can go to file complaint, but accused people can uh, uh, can uh, uh, can go to the court. But in this ca in this case, we find absence of uh, lawyer, so they the miss the rights and defense. And for example, I remember case for Bangladeshi. He is journalist here in Jordan. Uh, uh, his, uh, uh, I think, somebody from maybe his country uh, filed complaint against him because he wrote something about the role of uh, mission in Jordan to help the Bangladeshi people. And he was arrested and lawyer couldn't go to him because it's uh, not allowed for anybody to go outside and no translator through this uh, 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 judgment. And the deportation uh, uh, deportation uh, issued against him, but he stay in the in the jail till now because no uh, uh, no uh, uh, no no flag in this way. So we are talking about kind of justice absence all this period, even. When we have now particularly uh, that uh, the, the ban left, but still I think the uh, the justice in ban. Uh, beside very important issue regarding to electronic uh, uh, litigation or uh, uh, litigation online, I think maybe Jordan and any country not uh, ready for this. Uh, so we have problem regarding to this issue. Through the pandemic, we find that uh, many workers that uh, uh, the uh, fight it from their uh, uh, their uh, jobs, and uh, especially migrant workers. And yani sometimes we found one thousand two hundred workers at the same day they fight from uh, uh, from their uh, uh, their work, um, and also legislation uh, uh, based. We found that the government issued in the beginning of this month or, or the, at the end of last month in 30, May 30, they issued the 
uh, order number, uh, uh, sorry, note number seven. Uh, this no, uh, note re regarding to order number uh, six. Uh, this note excludes migrant workers from this note, from the protection of them. In, in spite of this note, it's also, it's, uh, it's not good for Jordanian and non-Jordanian for labor issue. Anyway, I think it's very important to work in the issue regarding to social and economic rights that uh, uh, violated through this period by the government, by the employer, and we don't have this balance between employers and employees. Uh, anyway, till now, it's very important to have this uh, uh, real judgment. This, till this, uh, till till now. Yeah. And for example, we try to file complaint uh, from the beginning of this week, but we fail because the uh, 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 public uh, uh, public prosecutor they refuse to receive any complaint. So till now, judgment uh, um, it's uh, stop, and nobody can uh, uh, can go regarding to strategic litigation, which is very important. Well, I think it's very important after <coughs> after reactivate the activation the uh, uh, defense law, as we have many cases regarding to this, many cases about the worker that uh, they lost their jobs, they lost their salary, about the <coughs> deduction from uh, from the salaries, about the annual leaves and other. In the, uh, in the case of um, domestic workers, we found through pandemic that the <coughs> domestic workers inside houses they, house they face violation by the employer, maybe because of uh, all the family members inside the house for all the day, and the stress because they are inside the house, they couldn't go outside. <coughs> they reflect the stress on the domestic workers. Regarding two cross-border litigation, well, I think it's very important, and we used to make this before <coughs> Sorry. In many cases, the uh, uh, the workers or migrants they deported, but we continue in this uh, in these cases. But the, in the issue of human trafficking, which is which is very important, we have to have this relationship between countries of origin and countries of uh, um, of destination in general. Uh, and also regarding to human trafficking, we found through pandemic, uh, uh, we found that no protection for victims of trafficking. The shelters, shelters <coughs> closed in front of them, so no place to to put them inside. Nobody received them. We faced many cases, and it was very difficult to deal with them. Not allow for us to go outside. Not allow for shelters to receive any. Uh, any victims, and we are talking about with women, women in crisis, women face violence, but nobody, <coughs> nobody received them, even the uh, the embassies, because it, it was not allowed for anybody, <coughs> anybody to go outside or to receive without uh, uh, a corona test, and even with corona test, they uh, they received, uh, they didn't receive this. Uh, and uh, regarding to access to health, it was no discrimination regarding to this between migrants and Jordanian, or Jordanian and non-Jordanian, but there is some, some problem regarding to access to, and it, it's, it was very good <coughs> for the government that they deal with access to health regarding to corona, but access to health regarding to other no, we found that uh, many people they didn't uh, uh, they couldn't go to the hospital, uh, and some of them died, and uh, <coughs> they faced many problems regarding to this. So I think it's very important important issue to focus on. Uh, <coughs> this is the issue now. Maybe I can complete after. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Sorry, Lina. Thank you so much for for your <coughs> presentation. So if you agree, uh, we're gonna move on to the, to the question and answer sessions. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna present some questions that we already have for Lizar, Carolina, and Lee. 
So I would like I would like to to start with Anissa. So you mentioned that we currently cannot uh, only rely on litigation, and we should think. Uh, about uh, the political world and society, especially in countries where there is a crisis like Lebanon and Venezuela, right? Can you tell us uh, a little bit more about how our role of us of, uh, as litigators and advocates and social society actors will change uh, in front of this context of, of Corona times? And also you mentioned that uh, using digital tools for judi judicial process is a good outcome of these corona times. So because of the pandemic, the um, star those online hearings that did not happen before or, or before are not that common. So, um, however, Linda just said that no country in the region is ready to this step. So according to your understanding and your perspective, uh, how does uh, these uh, digital tools affect uh, the access to justice in, in Lebanon? Uh, th those are the, the first two questions for Nisar. For Carolina, so, you talk about uh, the about the digital gap and inequality. So, what is one of the great problem or or concern that has become evident in the pandemic? So, in Latin America, is not having access to internet the same as not having access to justice? Um, what measures uh, have or should be implemented to guarantee the most equitable, equitable uh, access to justice now in Latin America, according to your, your presentation? And uh, the final question for Linda. So, Linda, uh, in your presentation, you um expose us all the concerns that you have in the corona times in jordan about migrants uh, and human trafficking but also uh we want to ask you now if maybe are there any positive elements that we can retain from the COVID crisis in in jordan or in the region and what are the measures that we can benefit from in the future? So um, with those questions, I'm going to give uh, the floor to, to, to Nisar to answer the first two ones. Nisar? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. So, I mean, regarding the digital uh, justice, I mean, uh, I mean, for many countries, and Lebanon is one of them, it's a first experience, I mean, in inquiring, interrogating through online. I mean, and of course, that that brings lots of problems. I mean, Carolina talks about some of those problems, about discrimination, and, and even it's not given to all judges to do this, because it depends on courts, on uh, the regional uh, 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 where the, uh, the courts are. In Tunisia and Morocco, in our region, I mean, they made a regulation about it. And in Tunisia, they made a regulation for all times, not only for Corona. So it was in the law, I mean, uh, and it is uh, uh, in order to protect the right to defense and to make in such sort that, uh, because you know, I mean, sometimes you, you are interrogating an accused person where he is at the police station where he was maybe tortured, but he can no more, I mean, talk about the torture because he is there. Uh, so as you need lots of guarantees to be done. But what I said in, in fact is that for us, I mean, we were asking for digital justice for years now regarding the migrants. Because for us, it was very, very difficult to have a real strategic litigation where uh, the domestic workers or the migrants, the abused migrants, might come to talk about their, their abuses and to, to have this narrative inside courts, because we believe 
in the importance of this narrative because they were deported. Sometimes they were arrested, interrogated, deported, even before the file arrived to, to the judiciary. So, and then the, the trial is met with in, her, in their absence. And most uh, sentences are done in abstentia. And so what we are claiming for was this kind of digital justice for the cases where it becomes really impossible for those person to come to court. I mean, and we saw that, I mean, through the corona, I mean, it's, it's an opportunity. I mean, we were talking about lots of challenges, about lots of negative uh, things on our work, but I mean, in this respect, I mean, it was something, um, an opportunity for us to say, ah, now the cross-border interrogation become possible. So now the judge is invited to hear uh, those domestic workers who are talking about trafficking, forced labor, or abuses, or so on. Because we know now there is a big, big number of people fired without paying them any salary for months. I mean, and they can come from very poor countries uh, in Asia and Africa. So that's what I said about digital and why it is it might be used as an opportunity. Of course, courts. Um, even WhatsApp meeting or what. So there are very different uh, tools to, to make this. And till now, Lebanon is not really regulated, um, is not really regulated. So, um, uh, so, uh, so there is lots of uh, case per case and uh, uh, initiative done by judges. So we, of course, we are going now to work on how to regulate this and to, uh, to advocate for that. Regarding the second question, am I about what we, I mean, what can be done in countries in Lebanon or Venezuela, which are really subject to big uh, economic problems? I mean, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's um, now you have a big number also of people who are fired from their works, or at least where the salaries became half or uh, reduced to half. Or even to the third, and you have the national currency which is losing his va its value and its power. And we have a problem with banks who are no more paying the depositors without having any law regulating this. So all this is bringing lots of problems. And you have the tenants and the land or the land, land owners. So we have many many types of litigation between different categories of people and everybody is ready to fight against anybody, employee against employer, tenants against landlords and so on. So it's becoming uh, it open door to uh, all kinds of litigations with a state which is really absent of all social issues and leaving, um, I mean, to society to, to deal with its problems I mean, like they, they, they know. So, I mean, so what, what can be done? I mean, to make a, um, a legal aid for all those people is quite impossible for our organization. Uh, the Bar Association now is quite, I mean, recently they are more involved in those social issues. So, but I mean, still now they keep uh, selecting what they want to do, but not really social rights. We think that it's time to have collective um, uh, cases. I mean, uh, to, to, to select our strategy litigation uh, um, in very, very uh, a smart way in order to have something uh, against a, um, which, have, which might have not a uh, effect only between uh, two people, but also to have an effect against one sector. For example, the banks, I mean, we go and sue the association of banks or we do this. So we are trying to uh, to have a stretch litigation with um, uh, using uh, association and syndicates and trade unions against uh, uh, collective uh, banks that we, we did, for example, regarding now the banks with the consumers 
the association of many association of consumers making uh, cases against the association of banks in order to get uh, um, uh, the, what is really needed for uh, because I mean the banks were not paying the salaries and so on. Um, uh, so um, uh, the salaries which were deposited in the bank. So that's what we are trying to do now. And uh, but of course, I mean how to select is a big big story. And um, and maybe I can stop here. Thank you so much, Nizar. Uh, Carolina, you have the floor. Thank you, Marilu. Thank you for the questions. Um, well, problems of access to justice are wider than the digital gap regarding access to justice in this particular time of the pandemic. So, I mean, we had way before uh, coronavirus problems regarding access to justice that goes to uh, the costs of the proceedings or having a lawyer, uh, the long the, what the proceeding takes so, to, too long to have a resolution and real access uh, to the courts, etc. So that's um, it's a it's a wider problem that we had in in Latin America. With this specific pandemic, um, we face several challenges. Uh, one is that judiciaries have been doing uh, an effort, an important effort. Most of them trying to provide access to justice. Uh, during this special time. And so digital justice or virtual justice or virtual mechanisms to provide access to justice has been one of the most uh, important tools to address this. And that is very welcome because the justice systems uh, previously had very, some of them had lack of technology and it's important to use technology. I think uh, what, I, what I want to stress is that with technology and with uh, more virtual access, to justice, we need to do some reflections on the specific things. There are many things, but uh, I, I wanted to stress two in, a, in this uh, particular conversation. One is that we cannot um, forget that uh, internet services are not really, um, for, are not, not everyone has access to internet services. Uh, sometimes it is not because of lack of connectivity, but because of lack of payment, uh, because internet services are somehow um, expensive. So this cannot be overseen, and we need to focus on that. There's also a matter of if we really know how to deal with this technology, is, if those persons know how to, um, how to address this, how to present uh, a remedy in uh, by internet, how to use internet, and also if judicial personnel know how to how to to deal with this technology. So it's a it's a complete reflection on on all, all of it. Um, and then I also think that we need to we need to analyze the specifics on other situations as due process guarantees, uh, right to counseling, to effective counseling. There is a reason as to why there are some hearings that are inherently to be face by face, as for example, uh, detention controls, because one want to always, judges need to control if there was no torture um, on police stations. So there are some hearings that are inherently have to be done um, in a face by face. And, that, and there are other safeguards on due process. So that is why I think um, this conversation is it's needed, and we we need to pro to come up with analysis and and suggestions and recommendations so we can all uh, uh, strengthen access to justice in reality. I will leave it there. Thank you so much, Carolina. Linda, the floor is yours. Yes. Um, I think it was, maybe I, I forget to mention this very important issue regarding to discrimination through the, uh, the pandemic or through the uh, uh, curfews in Jordan. Uh, we found that uh, we had uh, like uh, uh, quarantine in, in, uh, in five stars hotel uh, in the beginning of uh, from, from uh, March uh, uh, 15 till now. We didn't find any discrimination between domestic worker that came to Jordan at that time and Jordania and other, they bought 
each of them in in a private uh, room in five stars hotel. And also, we didn't find any discrimination in access to health regarding to um, um, Corona in, in the hospital uh, regarding to domestic workers, as, as we had, I think, three domestic workers that uh, uh, they get uh, this disease. Anyway, I think in, in the future, it's very important to work on the issue regarding to defense, uh, defense law and the results of defense law what happened regarding to this by uh, uh, against uh, uh, migrants and Jordanian at the same time because this uh, uh, harms uh, Jordanian and non-Jordanian, this law. And because as, as I mentioned in the beginning, that it's uh, disabled all legislation. It's given only the government to put all legislation still now. And we found many uh, regarding to this. Uh, third, I think it's very important to have migration policy, to have registration for all the migrants in, in, in our countries. Uh, um, migrants in formal situation and migrants in informal situation. And also the relationship between uh, uh, non-Jordanian and their, uh, uh, their uh, uh, embassies and their countries, and also human trafficking. All of us know that human trafficking, if we are talking about combating human trafficking, we are talking about prevention, protection, prosecution. So we miss the issue regarding to protection, how to protect, to protect the victims of trafficking, that it was absent uh, in all the uh, uh, all this period. Uh, anyway, we, we issued uh, uh, 12 uh, uh, reports about the situation under uh, curfew uh, from uh, March uh, uh, 18 till yesterday uh, about the sectors, about the nationality, about everything regarding this. I think we can use this in litigation and to, to, um, uh, to build uh, uh, cases regarding to this. Thank you. Thank you so much, much Linda. Linda. So, so finally, just to, to wrap it up, I, I have a final question for you all three. So um, and this is actually an open question. So I want to invite our three panelists to share with us maybe a final uh, reflection that you may want our audience to keep in mind at the end of this conversation. So if you if you have uh, if you are able to 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 identify those one two three key points that you want our audience to keep in mind, so please share with us in thirty one minutes uh, uh, now. So Nizar, we we're gonna start with you. Then Carolina and then Linda. Yeah, I mean. I just, I mean, I, um, I think that we are, um, all of us in the world, somehow going to have less liberties. Uh, and I, I mean, so we have to be ready for, um, for when, we, when we tackle any uh, freedoms of uh, our, our liberties or civic liberties, I mean, uh, that it might be, it might look as an unpopular uh, case. So we have to be ready for unpopular strategic litigation. And that should be, uh, uh, the, the, yeah, it becomes much more difficult to talk about necessity, proportionality, when a society is, uh, is subject to fear, to, uh, uh, and they feel that their, their life is in danger and so on. Um, so again, I mean, for those who are uh, working uh, on litigation, who believe in such litigation uh, in the use of law in order to promote rights and so on, I think really in the coming period we might have to think more about how to, um, what kind of strategy when we are facing an unpopular case. I mean. Uh, I, I mean, this is the most important point, I think, uh, in this Corona times. Thank you so much, Nisar. Carolina? 
Thank you. Um, I will I will strengthen three main ideas. Uh, first, uh, access to justice is fundamental in a democracy, especially during the pandemic. It's more fundamental indeed, so it has to be guaranteed. Second idea is that uh, proceedings cannot be postponed and suspended as suspended, and and that comes to the third idea, which is that judiciaries uh, need to come with a plan. Uh, that is public and transparent, that um, tell the people how are they going to guarantee access to justice or to provide uh, justice services during this time, and that they really also uh, think about the specific guarantees that can be, um, that need to be guaranteed also in the proceedings as this process, right to counseling, and so on. So that, that would be my three ideas. Thank you so much, Carolina. Uh, Linda? Uh, I think it's very important to talk about more spaces for uh, uh, CSOs that we found many difficulties last uh, uh, last period, not only in Jordan, but I think in, in many places. Uh, second, it's very important also to find some cases to work on, to work, if we are talking about migrant work in both uh, uh, countries of uh, of origin and countries of destinations. Well, I think we will face uh, a difficult period in, in, in coming uh, months regarding to, especially migration, regarding to repatriation, regarding to lost their uh, uh, their uh, uh, jobs. We are hearing about what happened in Gulf states, for example, and uh, of course in Jordan and other countries regarding to this. It's very important to be ready about this by reports, by litigation, and to complete uh, uh, each other as uh, organization roles. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. So with those inter 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 uh, interesting uh, com uh, conclusion, we are closing our, our conversation. So um thank you once again for our uh, to our wonderful panelists Nisar, carolina and linda for sharing your reflection with us today so we are pretty sure that, that they spark many future conversation i was honored to moderate this incredible panel today thank you also to everyone who watched this transmission today uh, now I, I want to uh, give the floor to Melissa. Melissa, we, would you please show us the graphic you made? Um, I think that you are available to, to share the screen with us now. Hello. Well, this is a part of I'm doing right now. I'm going to finish later <laughs> uh, to put some more drawings. Um, one important thing uh, that I heard in all of the uh, talk was the um, um, the important the important part of having access to justice and that uh, migration policy is needed and the unbalance between employees and employers. Okay, this image that just Melissa showed us uh, will be available for download from the social networks in the following days. So thank you, Melissa, for this uh, wonderful graphic memories as usual. So thank you. I also want to thank to the Justicia and the Legal Agenda teams for making this possible, especially to our communications and international teams working behind the scenes uh, before and during these three sessions. So this is our third and last webinar of the South South Dialogues series. If you were not able to follow the last sessions and you uh, are interested in, in our previous dialogue, please visit our YouTube channel uh, and you will find them record. So, Thank you again to all uh, our three panelists. Thank you, Melissa, also. Thank you, you all. Take care and goodbye. Thank you. Uh...